Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. You can go ahead and have a seat, and as you grab a seat, if you want to also grab a Bible, uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's some located under the seats in front of you, and uh, I'll tell you a passage that you can turn to. Just to get a head start, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians would be quite a bit of ways through your Bible, but Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, today we're going to continue in our series, but I'll just, I'm going to give you a little warning. Uh, I did a, a workout on Friday uh, with, I do CrossFit, and there's this thing they do every year, it's a competition, and, uh, and so anyway, long story short, I did a workout, and it's in my legs. My legs are so tight that I can't bend them, and uh, so it's funny, I always tell people, I feel like it, when I'm walking, I'm almost embarrassed because I, I, I refer to it as my cocky walk, because it looks like I'm trying to be cocky when I'm walking, but it's just, I'm, or like a penguin, but I just can't bend my legs, so I might sit down for a, a chunk of this today. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes, all right? You guys don't feel sorry for me at all, do you? <laughs> so we're continuing in a, a series on marriage, and uh, I'm going to do a very quick review, but I can't thoroughly do a, a review because we're talking about a couple of weeks. Um, and so I encourage you, if you were not here the last two weeks, get online, watch it, because it's not just simply a series about marriage, so that's the main theme. Uh, it's really about relationships. And, and every single week, uh, you need to hear this, every single week, though the focus is marriage, it is so much deeper than that. We're talking about how we relate, how we think about relationships, how God can do stuff in our hearts. And so where we begin, though, as we talk about marriage is that God has a very distinct design and purpose for marriage. It's found right in the beginning of the Bible. It's, it's one of the things he introduces uh, quickly in Scripture. And in Genesis chapter 2, here's God's desire for marriage. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The desire for, in God's perspective for us in marriage is that one plus one will equal one, that we will become one with, with our spouse in such a way that the idea of ever trying to separate that would be an impossibility. The same way that you can't separate who you are individually. You can't take half of who you are and separate. You just, I mean, it's just, as we even try to talk about that, you just go, man, that just doesn't make any sense. It's completely ridiculous. And he's saying that's exactly what he wants marriage to be like where two people are so unified that they're unified for their entire physical life. But what we recognize is that's difficult because we know that equation, one plus one equals one, it doesn't work because we're talking about two separate individuals. One plus one equals two. We know that. So what this series is about is discovering the ways that God has given us to truly become united in our marriages and in our relationship. And, and the way that we do that, simply put, is that we have to die to ourselves, we have to die to our wants and desires. And the same pathway that God gave us to connect to who he is, that the more we die to ourselves, the more we understand who he is, he says that's the same pathway in order to become one with your spouse, that when you die to yourself to live for them and put them as a priority, then you will truly start to become one. And so last week we looked at the idea of focusing on yourself first, not in a selfish way, but in a self-reflective way, evaluating your heart, allowing God to challenge you and change you before you ever start to look outward, before you ever start to date, before you ever start to critique your spouse, is you have to spend a season at least focusing on yourself. And this week we're going to continue with a theme that as I was studying and looking at it, I just thought, you know what, the ways of God are, are just so countercultural and counterintuitive. Um, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but I want to explain what those phrases mean, just in case you don't know. And uh, Because I, I've sometimes used that phrase, and people come up afterwards, and they'll say, like, what does that mean when you say that? When I say that the ways of God are counterintuitive, what is intuitive to us is what comes natural. It's instinctive. We don't have to really think about it. It's our natural way of responding. So when we say that something is counterintuitive, it goes against what is natural for us. And the same way when I say something is countercultural, it's the idea that all of culture is going a certain way and it goes against that. It's countercultural. And when we look at the teachings of Jesus, all throughout Scripture, they are now counterintuitive. It's not natural for us. I mean, we look at what he tells us to do, and, and there are some things that I think have become habits in our lives, or maybe we were raised in a certain way, our family taught us certain things. So there are certain things that are somewhat easy, but when you look at the whole of Jesus' teaching, it absolutely goes against what is natural, and it also goes against what our culture is telling us to do. And I would say not only is that true across the board of the teachings of Jesus, but as we look at something specific today, I think this is one of the most vivid examples of something that God wants us to do that absolutely goes against our nature, and it goes against our culture. 
what I teach today would actually somewhat be offensive in our culture. And when we get to it, you'll see what I'm talking about. But what we have to wrestle with in our lives, and I think consistently have this wrestle in our hearts and our minds, is to ask ourselves the question, do we really want to honor God in our lives? Is the, is the focus of our lives, is the purpose of our lives to honor God? Or do we want to live for ourselves and do we want to live what culture tells us to do? But do we want to honor God? And in that process of honoring God, do we want to die to ourselves? Not in the sense that we go like, yay, I get to die to myself. I want to do that. But where we just make that commitment, like, like eating healthy or exercising, it's not something that in, like right away you're like, yay, you know, I've got to give up fried food. Hooray. It, but it's a part of you, you just go, you know what, I know that's, that's better. I want to do that because I want to be healthier. Do we have that in our hearts where we say, I, w- I want to die to myself. I believe that I want to honor God in my life, but I want to die to myself because, and this is the big because, because I believe that the life that Jesus offered me is actually better than what the world offers. I believe that dying to myself will allow me to more fully experience the life that Jesus offers, and I, and I want that. And how that flows into the, the specific of the topic we're dealing with of marriage, do we come to the place where we think in our minds, I want to die to myself so my spouse can live. I, I really want to die to myself so that I can become one in my marriage. And the truth is, and I don't say this in any type of judgment, the truth is, is many people don't want to do that. What people will say is, I want a happy marriage. People will say, I want my spouse to change. I want my spouse to meet all of my expectations. But when we say, do you want to die to yourself so that you can be one, when we start to evaluate that, that's very, very difficult for us to say yes, because we realize in order to die to ourselves, I have to surrender all the things I'm frustrated about. I have to surrender all my expectations. I have to surrender all this long list of things that I'm holding against my spouse that they're not doing. And in my mind, I, I really do think if they would change their behavior, we would be happy. And so in order to die to myself, I have to take that list and rip it up and surrender that and say, no. I'm going to focus on myself. I'm going to focus on me and what needs to change in my life. And the question is, do we really want to do that? Because if we want to honor God, if we want to die to ourselves, if we believe his pathway is the the true life, and if we want to become one with our spouse, then we have to be willing to live a life that is counterintuitive and to live a life that is countercultural. And that's what we're going to look at today is an idea that is both of those things. And so I want to dive into the scripture, and, and I want to break this down. And what I want to do is the first half of today's teaching is really gonna be on us as individuals. So whether you're married or single, it does not matter. This is for all of us as individuals. And then the last portion of the teaching, I'm gonna look at the roles that wives play in a marriage and the roles that husbands play. But hear me on this. If you don't understand this first part and embrace this first part, then you can absolutely ignore the second half of the message. It only makes sense in the context of if we're willing to do what God calls us to do. And so in Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, we see this command that God gives us. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. That's what the book of Ephesians is. And prior to these, this verse we're gonna look at, prior to it, he's listing some things that we need to do. But in verse 21, he makes a turn and he addresses a concept of submission. And then everything that comes after is from the context of this one verse, okay? So he's teaching on other things, and then he says, and here's something you have to do, and in light of this, and then he's going to talk really about the family unit. He's going to talk about marriage. He's going to talk about being a parent. He's going to be talking about even working. And he says, here's what we're called to do, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Another way you can translate that, if you just want to put in a sentence we can understand is, Paul says, and here's what you're all commanded to do, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. Paul goes, here's the posture I want you to take. I want you to submit to each other. So we go, okay, what does that word mean, submit? It literally means, it's this really powerful term, it means to lower yourself, to subordinate yourself, to take a lower rank, a lower level of importance, and make others a priority. And how that practically plays out is you're lowering yourself and saying to others, what you want, your desires, and your needs are above my own. So I'm going to suppress what I naturally want to do And I'm going to take what you want and what you desire and what you need, and I'm going to raise that and make it a priority in my life. And so I'm going to lower myself so that you might thrive. Now, when we hear that, in a church setting, you go like, okay, yeah, that's what God's calling us to do. And then we think about it practically, and we go, what? Right? 
I mean, you, you all can, you can think about some relationships like, okay, yeah, I can do this in this relationship and that relationship. But God's like, no, this is what I'm calling you to do in all your relationships, in every environment. You know, as we hear that, when I hear that and I read that, I think, you know what? You know what? It's so hard. And hear me on this. Give me, give me a chance to explain what I'm about to say, okay? That verse seems anti-American to me. And what I mean about that is we very much have a culture in America of arrogance. Can we agree with that? If you don't agree with me, that's okay. All right? It's just an arrogant spot, you know, position to take, but <laughs> just kidding. But I remember when President Obama got elected, people were like, easy, Matt. Where are you going? All right? When he got elected, I remember early on in his presidency, as he was visiting other nations, out of respect, he would bow. So if it was their culture, he would go and they would bow and he would bow to them and people lost their minds. Does anyone remember this? People were freaking out. Why? Because the president of the United States does not bow. Why? Why? Because we're Americans. And I remember watching it going like, who cares if he bows? <laughs> we're still Americans, right? Like, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change our economy. It doesn't change our military. But people are like, no, Americans cannot bow. And this past Winter Olympics, you guys notice this in the opening ceremonies. When the, the nations are walking, almost every other nation, when they walk by the heads of state, what do they do? They bow. Do you know what nation does not bow? Americans. Americans walk by, and they'll, they'll wave, and they'll nod. I mean, they'll look up, but they're told, you do not bow because you're an American. There's something in our culture that's ingrained in us that the idea of submitting, of showing honor, of showing respect is weak. And so there's something about us where we wrestle with this. And God says, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to live a life that is counterintuitive. I want you to live a life that is countercultural. And he says, and why? You're not doing this because it makes you happy. You're doing this, what does he say? Out of reverence for Christ. And this word reverence is a powerful word. It is more often translated fear, out of fear of Christ. Now, when you hear these things, okay, that sounds like a negative. Uh, a few weeks ago, so in my home, at night, I have my sons read from their Bibles, like age-appropriate Bibles. So my youngest son has a, a picture Bible, the Action Bible, and he reads from that. And then my other son has the translation that our children's ministry uses, and it's great for him. And then my oldest son uses the same translation that we use. And I have all of them read from their Bibles at night, and then they come in and they ask me questions. So, Dad, I just read this. Can you explain this thing to me? So my son, Cole, my oldest, came in uh, probably last week, maybe a week ago, two weeks ago. He came in and he said, can I ask you a question? And we're going through the questions. And he says, Dad, this talks about fearing God. Like, isn't that a bad thing? Why would we ever want to fear God? And I said, okay, Cole, let me, let me ask you some questions. I said, do you, do you love me? And he goes, yeah. I go, do you think I love you? He goes, yeah. I go, okay. I said, do you want to have a relationship with me? He goes, yeah. I go, do you think I want to have a relationship with you? And he goes, yeah. I go, so do you want to hang out with me? He goes, yeah. And I go, do you think I want to hang out with you? And he goes, yeah. I go, so are you afraid of me? And he goes, no. And I go, do you think I want you to be afraid of me? He goes, no. I go, are you afraid to disobey me? He goes, yeah. <laughs> and I go, yeah. And that's exactly the relationship what God's talking about is God doesn't want us to be scared of God. He doesn't want us to withdraw. He knows that he wants us to love him and know that he loves us. He wants to be in a relationship. But he wants there to be an element where we go, but I'm afraid to disobey God. Why? Because God in his love as a heavenly father will discipline and he'll resist, and there will be consequences to the choices we make in our lives. And, and he says, when teaching us, he goes, I'm commanding you to submit, and this is for those who want to honor God, want to follow God, but he says, not because you, it makes sense to you, not because you want to, not because it's easy. He says, out of fear or reverence for Christ, out of this deep respect of God, I don't want to disobey you. And so he does, I mean, just even how he frames it is pretty intense. He doesn't say, just trust me, this is going to be better. He says, do it because, in essence, because I told you. And I want there to be a caution in your heart to disobey this command. And as we look at the concept of submitting to each other, of taking a posture in our marriages, in our relationships, in our work environment, in our families, where we're saying, I'm not going to focus on myself, I'm going to focus on you. When we go to our jobs, and, and typically in a, in a job environment, it's, I got to think about how to protect mine. I got to think about how to protect my interests and get the most out of it. And, and he says, I, I just don't want you to think that way. And there's some tension with there that I want to address. On one hand, it looks weak. I think it's part of the problem why we wrestle with it. it. It looks weak, and none of us want to be weak. But here's the truth. It looks weak, but it is strong. 
It's, it's a strong position, and here's the reason why. When we are weak, it allows the strength of God to be perfected in our lives. The Apostle Paul, the same guy who wrote this letter, wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, and here's what he said. He's talking about Jesus. He says, but Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness, not in strength. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on to say, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you know when you are at your absolute strongest? When the Spirit of God is working through your life. When the Spirit of God is agreeing with what you're doing and he's partnering with you. And and the only time we reach out to God is when we need God. When we're in a position of weakness where we're struggling, that's when we most often reach out to God and say, God, I need you. And, And God goes, that's what I want. I want you to be perpetually in a state of desperation for God. For us as parents, I don't want my kids to be desperate for me their entire lives. I want them to grow to maturity because I have a goal that they're going to move out of my house at some point, okay? I love my kids, but I love my wife more, and I'm looking forward to that time. I won't say that in third service when my son is in here, but, but in this relationship, I want my kids to grow to maturity. But in a relationship with God, as we grow to maturity, the level of maturity is that we depend more and more on God. It's counter-cultural. It's counter-intuitive. It's the upside-down kingdom. And God says, when you are at your weakest and you reach out to him, it is in that moment that his strength is perfected in our lives. And this is what God wants for us in a position of submission to go, this is tough. This is difficult. My flesh is like, no, I don't want to submit. No, I don't want to do what's best for them because I want to do what's best for me because I know what's best. And, and we have this tension. He goes, yes, when you're in that state, the only way you can be successful is in that condition to say, God, I need your help. I need you to help me because, man, I don't want to do this. I don't want to love my spouse this way. I I don't want to treat my coworker this way. I want to choke my boss out, and I'm just tired of it, and I need your strength. I know I use the reference of choking people out a lot. I got to probably change that, but (laughs) people are like, you're violent, Matt. Just for the the record, I've never choked anyone out, okay? (laughs) Been tempted, but never done it. Here's the second thing. It looks foolish. That posture looks foolish to us, but it actually is wise. In 1 Corinthians, so Paul again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And in that same passage, if you were to go back to verse 18, Paul says something really dynamic. He goes, if you think about the cross, so this is kind of my paraphrase of this. He goes, if you think about the cross, as in what Jesus, his work on the cross. Jesus went there, he died on the cross for our sins so that we might have the possibility to have our sins forgiven, the chance of eternal life. So the the work of the cross, when he uses that term, he's talking about all that it encompasses. He says, do you know that the word or the work of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing? But to those of us who are being saved, it is both the wisdom and power of of God. Here's what Paul says. He goes on and explains it. He goes, some people look at what Jesus did on the cross and they go, that's foolishness. I mean, he says the Jews, it's a stumbling block to them. The Greeks, they don't understand it because in the Jewish mindset, they thought the Messiah would come and be just like King David, that he would come and conquer Rome, that they would be a military power. So in their concept of life and freedom was freedom from Rome. So Jesus going to the cross and dying made no sense to them. The Messiah died? What good is that? We're, we're still under Rome uh, authority. This is, this is nonsense. He goes, so to them, it was foolishness. The Greeks who celebrate wisdom and philosophy, they looked at this guy and he died and they thought, what good is that? He was killed for his beliefs. That's, that's pointless. So they both missed the power of what's going on. But Jesus, who surrendered his life and died on his cross, Paul goes, but to us who receive this incredible gift, it changes our lives. Our sins are forgiven. Our future is eternity with God. We have everlasting life. He goes, so to us who are being saved, yeah, to the world it looks like foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is both the wisdom and power of God. Amen? And so in the idea of submission, we look at it and we go, it looks foolish, and it does on the surface. But when it changes your heart, 
and it connects you deeper in a relationship with God, you understand God is wise. God knows what he's doing. Here's the next tension. It looks vulnerable. And when we talk about vulnerability, what vulnerability is, is the, the, the threat of something bad happening to you. Where you feel the most vulnerable, it seems most likely that something bad's going to happen to you. So the idea of submission is if I submit, there's a good chance something bad will happen to me. Someone will take advantage of me. But the truth is, is in this position, you're blessed. It looks vulnerable, but is blessed. And what I mean by that is God will supernaturally bless those who submit. Here's what one of Jesus' closest friends, Peter, one of his apostles, said. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Why? And he's quoting the scriptures. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God actually will give grace. He'll work. He'll supernaturally bless the humble. And he goes on in the next verse. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. And that's a, that's a concept that is found throughout the Psalms and the Proverbs and all throughout the Scriptures. God opposes, he resists, he curses those that are arrogant, those that are prideful. But to those that are humble, that submit, God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to supernaturally move on your behalf. And so there is the fear. Yes, someone's going to take advantage. And you know what? Someone probably will. Someone will understand you're a nice person, and they might take advantage of that because they have no character, and they don't have the same conviction of you. But God's promise is, but I'm going to come alongside you and in front of you and on your sides and behind you, and I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to be there, and you're going to have blessings that you won't get any other way. I'm going to move in your mind and your heart. I'm going to move in your situation. And this is the promise of God that we see executed all throughout Scripture. Then here's the last one. It looks countercultural. And you know what? That's the true one. But it is like Jesus. And this is the heart that we have to understand. This is our goal. Amen? We want to be like Jesus. I'm not trying to be like a CEO. I'm not trying to be like a business leader. I'm not trying to be like a celebrity. I'm not trying to be like someone else around me. When I look at all their qualities, I might look at something and say that's admirable and some things I can learn. I'm not saying that you can't learn from anyone. But the ultimate goal of our lives has to be, I want to be like Jesus. I don't even want to be like his apostles. I mean, those guys are awesome, and there's so many things I can learn. But my ultimate standard is, I want to be like Jesus. And this is what Jesus was like. Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. I mean, I love how he's wearing this. He's like, I'm begging you. If there's any reason why you will listen to me, any point, okay, he's talking to Christians. He goes, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. I mean, he's talking about this church. He's like, I want you guys to be in complete unity, being in full accord of, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. And here's what he says. Oh, this is so tough. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, so you can look to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And then he's like, here, let me give you a little context. Because he knows how hard it is to hear that and think about that in practical and you'll think, like, that doesn't make sense. I'm the boss. I'm the parent. I'm the husband. I'm the whatever. And you, you go, that doesn't make sense. He goes, okay, have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And what he's about to do is say, okay, let's think about Jesus for a second. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He goes, think about Jesus. He was in heaven, and he was rightfully in heaven because he's God. And in his place of heaven, he was receiving the comforts of heaven, the glory of it. He was being praised. Everything that he deserved, but he did not see that as something he needed to wrestle with and hold on to. But he surrendered that and emptied himself and took the form of his creation 
And in that form, he humbled himself. Now get this. He humbled himself first to the plan of the Father. Whatever God told him to do, God the Father, Jesus did. Even though he was God, he walked in obedience. But that led him to obey his creation, to submit himself to the point where his creation was able to kill his physical body when he was here on earth. He submitted himself. Why? For the potential that others might be saved. I've said this often, but if there was ever a person who came to the earth that deserved to be worshiped, to deserve to demand that everyone serves him, gives everything to him and worship, it would be Jesus. He should have just walked around and said, serve me, serve me, serve me, serve me. And the world should have bowed and served him. But in the form that he took, he came and he served others. He met people in the worst of their conditions and he gave them love. He thought about them more than himself. He washed the feet of his disciples. He touched the sick people that no one else had physically touched. He would go to them and touch them and heal them. They hadn't even received a physical touch in years, and and God would touch them, emotionally touch them, physically touch them, spiritually touch them. And he would go to the broken, the rejects of culture, the tax collectors that everyone hated, and, and he would welcome them in. All that Jesus did was in humility, and Paul goes, this is our example Not anyone else or anything else. This is our example. And so in this context, Paul, who says, submit one to another out of respect for Christ or fear of Christ, he's now gonna transition and start to talk to wives and husbands. But if we don't have this heart, then the commands to the wives and the husbands make no sense. But if we have this heart, then it all of a sudden starts to become clear. And understand this, everything that Paul says, it's not to hurt anyone, it's not to harm anyone. Everything he's saying is with the intention Do you want to become one? Do you want to become one with your spouse? As he goes on, talks about the family unit. Do you want your family unit to be one? But the question we have to wrestle with is, are we willing to do this? And I'll say this for you couples that are here today. This is who Paul is not talking to. He's not talking to people who have drawn line in the sands and they're burying themselves in for their positions to fight. That's not the context. He's not trying to convince you that this is right. He's talking to people who are going, I really want to be one. I really want that in my relationship. And so here's what he says in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. You think that's a little bit countercultural? <laughs> Here, I, so the, you know how me, I, I'm, I'm kind of a smart ox, so it seems like I'm joking sometimes when I'm not. I realize the tension of speaking that out loud. There's an element of it that feels awkward to me, especially in light of what's going on in our culture right now. So I, I want to address two separate things. I am, if I can use this term, it's, it feels awkward to use this term, but I am happy about what's going on in our culture in that we're addressing the inequalities in the genders. I'm so happy about that the way that women have been mistreated. I'm glad that this is being exposed. It's heartbreaking. I mean, it is just heart-wrenching to see the abuse, the sexual harassment, the sexual assault, the inequality in pay. I'm so thankful that all this is coming to light. But that is a different issue. So I'm saying I'm so thankful for that, but that's a different issue than what we're talking about. What we're talking about in this context is not women as they relate to men. It has a wife will relate to her husband. It is in a specific context between two people who want to become one. So Paul's not saying, what it's not saying in this, it's not saying that women are inferior. It's not saying that women should be abused ever in their lives. It's not saying that the husband should dominate. It's not saying any of that. It's saying in a relationship, here's the best way to operate. And he says, wives, submit. Make your husband the priority. Follow him. Let him lead. Respect him. It's not necessarily an emotion, but in your behavior, I'm going to I'm gonna act in a way that's honorable to him. But I would say, and I've heard women say this in frustration and I feel their pain, but they're like, but I don't respect my husband in my heart. But I would say to you, start. Start loving them. Start honoring them. Start celebrating anything possible that they do that can be remotely good or positive. Hey, today they picked up that one sock. I'm gonna celebrate that. I mean, start somewhere small, but honor them in your heart. Put his needs first. But again, what this is not saying is that you're less than. It's not that at all. It's a posture with the hope that two will become one. And this behavior is one aspect of your obedience to God. It says to do this as to the Lord. And the reason you can do this in faith is because Jesus did this. 
Jesus submitted himself for the potential of good. And so he says, as the same way that Jesus submitted, wives, submit. Take a posture of humility. Don't try to always be leading. Don't create a standard of what your marriage needs so that you can judge your husband against that, where you're going, okay, here's the list. Are you doing this? Nope. I'm giving you a D on that one, C plus on that one. Don't be that mindset. Be a mindset that just looks at your husband and says, I just wanna celebrate you. I wanna love you. I wanna encourage you. I wanna make you the best you as possible. And, he's, and here's the weight of this. As Paul communicates, he says, as Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of the home. I mean, this is super blunt. I'm going to come back to this. It, it, on the surface, this might seem like bad news for the women, but I tell you, it's bad news for the guys. It's much harder for them. But he says, your husband is the head of the home. He's in charge. It's the same way. And he goes, and wives submit. And what does this look like? He says, the same way that the church submits to Christ, this is how you need to submit. So how does the church submit to Christ? Well, here's what we do as a church. I'm the lead pastor. I'm the primary leader of our church. You know how we submit? We pray, we seek God, God tells us where we're supposed to go as we best can process that. And there are many times that God commands us to do things that in my, from my perspective, I go, that doesn't make sense. I'm not sure that I'm comfortable doing that. That's terrifying to me. But out of respect for God, obedience, we walk in faith believing God is faithful and God is wise, right? God is faithful, God is wise. That's why we submit always. God is faithful, God is wise, and God is God. Because he said so is enough reason. So I'm gonna walk in obedience. And for you and your relationships, wives, you submit, why? Because God is faithful and God is wise. Not that your husband is faithful, not that your husband is wise, because God is faithful, God is wise. And he says, in the same way, trust in God. And what's the fear? Let's just acknowledge it. What's the fear? What if I submit and my husband doesn't change? What if I submit and my husband doesn't love me the way he's supposed to? What if I submit and just fill in the blank? Well, here's what I'd say to you. We gotta acknowledge that real tension. You know the possibility? You submit and your husband doesn't do what he's supposed to do and you don't become one, like scripture says, that it's broken, it's fractured, and it's frustrated. That is a real possibility. But do you know what also is a possibility? What if you submit and he's not that way? But what if through your submission, your example changes him? Here's what Peter says. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. You have an, an option or ability to potentially change the heart of your husband. I've, I shared this, this last week or the week before. In my marriage, a pivotal point was how Mary treated me. She just loved me in spite of me, and it changed my perspective. Mary led through just an incredible example. And you have that potential. If you submit, there's the potential that he will change and you will become one. But if you don't submit, I can promise you, I can guarantee you, you will not become one. If you do not take that posture, you will not be one in your marriage. And so the same way that Jesus submitted for the potential that some might be saved you submit for the potential that your husband will change and turn and love you the same way that he's called to. So now let's transition. So wives, it seems that you, that you have it hard, but really in those three verses that we looked at, two of them were really to wives. One of those verses were to men that we're gonna see in a minute. But Paul then goes on and talks five times that to the men. And here's what Paul says. Let's go back to verse 23. Men, you ready? You ready? This is good. You guys get excited, men. Get excited, husband. If you're a husband in here, I need you to get excited, all right? Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. I want every husband to high-five someone around him, all right? All right, let's go on deeper. Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. So you get to be just like Jesus. <laughs> Give another high-five, guys. You guys are like, nope, I know where you're going, Matt. You're setting us up big time. It says, and here's the verse, and is himself its savior. So what this means is he says, Husbands, the same way that Christ is the head of the church and its savior, you get to be that way. So let's look at that for just a second. How did Jesus save the church? He went to the cross and he died. Husbands, double high five someone next to you. You get to die, okay? Your wives get to submit, you get to die. And he goes to verse 25 and he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, if you're a guy here, you know I speak way more bluntly to the men than I do anyone else. 
You are the head in leadership by dying to yourself so that your wife might live. Hear me on this, because I want to speak this boldly and bluntly to you, men. This is the only acceptable standard of leadership. Domineering leadership is not godly. Saying you're the head of the home and putting your fist down is not what God intended. God intended for you to lead through dying to yourself, that when your spouse sees you, they don't see a selfish man domineering, leading through aggression. They see a man who dies to himself in every way so that his wife might thrive. Amen? And this is the difficult challenge that we have as men is that we, by nature, are aggressive. We, by nature, want to tackle and conquer things. But what he says is we have to go against our, what is intuitive to us, what is natural to us, to live a life that our wives might thrive. And he goes on and says, let's look at what Jesus did. This is what Jesus did, that he may sanctify her, talking about the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So what did Jesus do? Jesus came to the earth and he lived a life of submission, of service, of care, of humility. And the reason he did this, get this, is so that the church might thrive, that the church might be the best version of itself. He went to the cross and died so that the church might be forgiven, that it might be able to be in a relationship with the Father and receive the Spirit to fill them so that the church in every way might thrive, okay? What Jesus did, his powerful work, is the reason we're here 2,000 years later. So everyone, think for a second all that Jesus has done for your life, okay? Here's the next verse. Paul says, and I want all the men to say this loudly with me, in the same way. He says, husbands, this is what you're called to. What Jesus did, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Husbands, your servant leadership should be such that it leads your wife toward a deeper relationship with Christ. Your servant leadership of dying to yourself should be in such a way that your wife feels more secure about herself, that she feels more loved, more secure, that she wants to connect to Jesus more because of how you are loving her, that she sees the example of Christ in you and just thinks, this is wonderful. And in a culture that is changing the dynamics of gender and of women and men and how they think and all of that, here's what I know. I've yet to meet a woman that would not respond to that type of leadership, of a, of a man who is loving and caring and dying to himself so that she might flourish. And so every husband here, you have to ask yourself, are you leading in such a way that your wife is better for knowing you? that your wife is more secure in herself and in the insecurities that all of us carry? It is, are those being alleviated because she just feels safe around you? Going all the way back to the beginning of time where Adam and Eve stood in front of each other and they were naked and unashamed, not just physically, but in every way emotionally, not worried that someone's gonna take advantage of them or misuse them. And as a husband, I mean, are, is this your priority? As you look at your wife, you just think, what can I do so that you might thrive? And this is what we're called to do. And, and Paul says, women, if you'll submit, and men, if you'll die to yourself, the next verse, here's the whole context. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Do you see the context here? Paul's like, do you want to become one? Here's what it requires. Women, submit. Don't try to lead the relationship. Don't try to always be nagging your husband. You gotta do this. And Sorry to mimic your voices, but you gotta do this and you gotta do that. And you gotta change. You gotta be this way. Instead, take a posture where you just go, man, I just wanna love you. I wanna encourage you. What do you need? And I'll tell you, the same way I boldly spoke to the men, I've yet to meet a man that won't respond to that. I've never met a man that goes, man, I wish my wife nagged more. <laughs> but I've met men that, man, when, when their wives love them and honor them, they just thrive. And their response is, man, I want to love you back the same way. So, so wives, submit. And he says, and husbands, if you'll die, put your wife as a priority. Here's Paul's guarantee. And the two will become one flesh. That's when they become united. That's the potential. And some of you are hearing this and you're thinking, but what if he does? And what if? Okay, don't think that way. Realize there is a powerful God on your side that says, I want to bless what you do. 
You submit, I'm gonna work on your husband. Husbands, you die, I'm gonna work on your wives. And it's for the potential that some might be saved. Some might be changed. Jesus, when he died on the cross, there was really no one actively following him. His disciples had scattered. He submitted himself to the point of death, not because of the reality of what was happening in that moment. It was for the potential of what would happen. He had faith that the Father would draw many to him. And so he went to the cross and he died. And now 2,000 years later, billions of people have come to know Jesus and his work. Why? Because he submitted himself to the point of death. Wives, you can submit because your Savior submitted. Husbands, you can die because your Savior died. And this is the context for the message today. Are we willing to do what is so unnatural, counterintuitive, countercultural for the potential that we can experience the full life that Jesus offers us? And here's how Paul ends this teaching in verse 32. He says, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So what we're gonna do now is, as this sits on our hearts and in our minds, we're gonna take time to celebrate communion. And so I would ask, even for you, you can just go ahead and start to think that way. And I would invite our communion servers to come up and prepare the elements. But I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about communion. I want you to think about what it represents. It represents everything that we're calling ourselves to do today, right? We're, we're, we're talking about, hear this, if you're single you're taking, and we're married, you're taking a posture of submission to everyone. I wanna think about others before myself. If you're married and you're the wife, it's, you're called to submit. If you're the husband, you're called to die. Communion represents all of this. Jesus died. He took what wasn't his, the take, I mean, in the sense that the punishment upon his body, he didn't deserve that. But he did all of that so that each one of us might thrive in our lives. This is our example. And so today, as we take communion, the bread, and we drink of the juice, we're remembering that Jesus is our example. He's the reason we can do this. He's the reason we should do this. And we're believing that in faith, if we do this, he will bless it. And so as we take communion, I want each one of you to make this really personal. How we celebrate communion is you'll come up and you'll get the elements. I'll walk you through that in a moment. But I want you in this time to consider what you need to do differently in your life. I want you to think about where you need to submit individually and in all the relationships, if you're married in that relationship, and allow the Spirit of God to give you wisdom and conviction today and point you in the right direction. Why? Because it's the potential that someone can change and you can change so that if you're married, you'll become one, if you're single, so that you can learn this powerful truth before you get married.